Rhythmic gymnastics, a sport that focuses on grace, power, flexibility, performance, and coordination. It is a combination of dance, ballet, and acrobatics, although there is no flipping or tumbling involved. Rhythmic gymnasts manipulate one of five apparatus in one routine. They either use a ball, a ribbon, a hoop, a jump rope, or two clubs. Girls can also do a floor routine in which no apparatus is used. There is also the possibility of participating in a group routine in which many girls perform together and exchange apparatus throughout the routine. I have been competing in rhythmic gymnastics for 11 years now. Throughout my time in the gym, my coaches have given me tips on how to hold the apparatus in this toss or that move, getting as specific as how my finger should be placed. I never questioned their advice since it usually worked, but I was always curious as to why their advice worked. I made this video to explore the physics behind rhythmic gymnastics. I wanted to explore the science and calculus behind not only my favorite sport, but also behind the critique I've been hearing and tips I've been listening to for so much of my life. I always wondered, what am I doing to make this happen? Or why is this work when done one specific way? Using video analysis software and with the help of my physics teacher, I was able to articulate these techniques and even extract new ones I had not thought about before. One of the basic moves with the rope is called a cowboy. Moving your arm up and down while simultaneously moving your wrist in circles makes the rope have a sort of figure eight shape. The timing of the wrist circles with moving your arm up and down is very important. The general rule is that you make one circle when the rope is at the bottom and then two when the rope is at the top. When analyzed with Logger Pro software, I was able to track the end of the rope and its figure eight motion and see how the wrist circles were actually timed with the rope moving up and down. The final graph looked like this. The blue represents the vertical movement of the rope, while the red represents the horizontal movement of the rope. The blue curve is very basic. It shows that the rope moves down, then up, then down, and back up again, and continues like that. The red bumps represents the rope's movement going back and forth, right and left. When the rope moves up, that means that it moves to the right. When it moves back down, it moves to the left. Every bump, or quick rotation, was a rotation of my wrist. One wrist rotation is seen when the rope is at the floor. The next bump is seen when the rope is beginning to move up. And the last bump, or rotation of my wrist, happens when the rope is moving down. I was also able to track my wrist and see how that related to the movement of the rope. Again, the blue represents the vertical movement. So it shows that my arm moved up, 
stayed above my head, and then came back down. The red represents the horizontal movement. So again, when I make a rotation with my wrist. This graph also showed that there is a rotation at the ground, like I was taught, but that the next two rotations of my wrist are not actually when the rope is above my head. The second rotation happens when my arm is almost above my head. And the last rotation happens when my arm is beginning to move down. One toss with the ribbon is called a boomerang. Holding the end of the ribbon, the gymnast tosses the ribbon stick and at the right moment pulls the end of the ribbon so the stick bounces back to her. This is another example of when timing is important. If the ribbon stick doesn't hit the floor, then the ribbon won't bounce back. Same goes for if the ribbon stick is on the floor for too long. The other important aspect to keep in mind is having the ribbon go far enough. If it is too short, so the ribbon goes too high, the stick won't bounce back. If the ribbon is tossed too far, so the ribbon goes too far, the stick won't bounce back, but rather shoot back and you won't be able to catch it. When the timing is mastered, you are able to get more creative. toss of the hoop, forward roll or somersault, and catch the hoop on the floor. This is one of the first tosses that girls are taught how to do. The main coaching advice with this toss is that when you are tossing the hoop, you let go of the hoop so your elbow is in line with your nose. This should be the right angle to give you enough time to roll and then sit up to catch the hoop. The hoop moves through the air in a parabola shape. Letting go of the hoop when your elbow is in line with your nose should be the correct angle for the correct parabola that would let the hoop fall in the exact spot that you would be at after the somersault. If you let go of the hoop before your elbow is in line with your nose, the parabola will be too big. The angle will be smaller, so the hoop will go too far. If you let go of the hoop after your elbow is in line with your nose, the parabola will be too small since the angle is too big and the hoop will land behind you. There are many parabolas found in rhythmic gymnastics, since a big part of the sport is throwing something in the air. The apparatus can't go in a straight line because the force of gravity pulls down on it. So instead, the apparatus moves in a parabola shape. So the important aspect of these many tosses is to toss the apparatus at the right angle. right here. You want it to travel far enough so you can do enough underneath as well as it traveling high enough so you have enough time. The horizontal line and vertical line are vectors, a quantity that requires both magnitude and direction. They represent the two kinds of velocities that the apparatus exhibits. The sum of these two components of velocity forms a diagonal line, the resultant, which is the velocity of the apparatus. 
It forms the initial angle of the apparatus before it moves in that parabola shape. Gymnasts don't always toss with their hands. One example of a toss without hands is this flip with the ball. It is another example of when timing is important, since the ball has to go at the right angle. The blue, since it represents the vertical movement, shows how the ball moves up and then moves down. It is in a parabola shape, but that's due to the fact that the ball decelerates due to gravity. The ball starts out going fast, but then it begins to slow down. For a very short period of time, the ball stops moving completely, but then it begins to go faster and accelerate due to the force of gravity. The red, since it represents the horizontal movement, shows how the ball goes to the left, which is why it seems like the ball is going down. It also shows that the ball moves at equal increments of time, since no force is acting on the horizontal movement. Something else that I was able to examine using this software was the apparatus velocity, which is a measurement of an object's speed as well as its direction. The ball has a constant acceleration because its speed changes by the same amount for every increment of time, by the force of gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second per second. The graph is negative because gravity is a negative force. As the ball begins, it is moving in a positive direction, up, but against a negative force, gravity. Therefore, the velocity decreases. But then, once the ball changes direction, it is moving in a negative direction with the negative force of gravity, so the velocity begins to increase. What happens horizontally is not affected by what happens vertically. That's why this graph of the horizontal velocity is different than the vertical velocity. The horizontal velocity graph shows that the horizontal velocity is constant throughout the whole toss. This is because gravitational forces does not act on the horizontal movement of the ball. In fact, the only force that does act on the ball is air resistance, but that is so minor that it does not show a change in the horizontal velocity. Again, the graph is slightly negative because the ball is moving from right to left. Clubs. They look a little bit like bowling pins or something one would see in a circus act. One of the basic moves with these are flipping and juggling them. The second basic move with clubs is called mills. You make one circle on one side and then another circle on the other side. The second club follows the first. Mills can be done in any direction, in front of the gymnast, above the head, or in a circle. If the circles aren't done smoothly, then the clubs get stuck or you get hit in the face. When graphed, mills are shown as a sine curve since the club basically moves back and forth across the horizontal axis and then back and forth across the vertical axis. The graph being so repetitive showed that the movement is just repetitive circles, no other tricks involved. The circles just have to be properly timed. As you can see, they have the same period of rotation.
Circle of mills is a combination of the basic mills while rotating your arms so they move in a bigger circle. It's a sinusoidal motion within a sinusoidal motion. When graphed, the circles were able to be seen. Again, the takeaway was that the increments of time are very important in order for this to work. Every wave seems to be done within the same amount of time. There are no extra circles or movements of the clubs involved. Here is a graph of when I made a mistake with this move. See how the increments of time are not the same, but rather kind of messy. Here you have one wave, and then the next wave is much bigger. Thus why the trick did not work this time. Through my investigations and video analysis, I not only found that my coach is usually right with her suggestions, but that timing is incredibly important with this sport. I also discovered that many of the same principles describe why tricks work the way that they do. I hope to coach over the summer and whenever I can in my future so I can use these new and improved coaching tips.